Hello, this is Bill Hopkins for the Cross Timbers chapter of the Native Plant Society of Texas. Our trees have been having a tough time lately. Drought, freeze, oak wilt, and invaders such as the emerald ash borer and diseases. Especially since the winter storm of 2021 and the drought, trees are more susceptible to disease and pests moving in. Today, we have woodland ecologist Kimberly Peterson from the Texas A&M Forest Service to help explain what's happening with our stressed out trees. Kimberly is based in Mineral Wells and is responsible for 29 counties in the North Central Texas area. She grew up in Mansfield and has a master's degree in agriculture and natural resources from Tarleton State University. She joined the A&M Forest Service in 2021. Welcome Kimberly. Okay, so my contact information is at the bottom of the screen. Um, that is my work cell, so you can either call or text that number. Just make sure if you text, make sure you tell me who you are. Okay, a lot of people don't do that. You'd be surprised. And I'm like, I don't know who you are. But um, my email address is also at the bottom of this page. All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about, the fall webworm. Um, these form large webs in the canopy of the trees. Uh, their larvae are approximately one to one fourth inch with uh, groups of long silky hairs. Uh, body color can vary um, from a yellow to a uh, or brown. It also has a black or orange yellow spots on it. Um, are brown and found inside a gray silky uh, cocoon. Uh, disease, starvation, predators, parasites, um, and unfavorable weather take a toll on these insects. Um, for shade trees, what you're going to want to do is just remove uh, the webs and large hole to reach up there to get those down. Um, insecticides for large infestations, if it's just a small infestation, you don't necessarily need to worry about it. Um, the adult moths usually appear in May. So on the screen, you're going to see that uh, the adult moth, I think it looks pretty. I think it looks kind of like a dragon or mystical creature. Um, so that's what that would look like. And then you can see on the pupae that it has those long, nice, long, silky hairs. OK, so the eastern tent caterpillar, uh, we have two type of uh, tent caterpillars in the state. Um, this one does build tents, the other one doesn't. Um, the eastern tent caterpillar, it's found in plants. So I saw a whole bunch of them earlier this spring um, at the park up in Springtown. So the, um, egg masses are usually encircled around smaller branches. Uh, the larvae hatch as leaves are unfolding from the buds. Um, and these are usually not an issue, um, but they do become common in the spring. Uh, you're going to use BT or Bacillus thuringiensis for control. So if you look on, so I want you all to pay attention to the moth, okay? You're going to really kind of notice the difference between this tent caterpillar versus the other one. This one is lighter than the other. So you see how that band changes? So that's a really good way to tell the difference between the two adults. Um, the forest tent caterpillar, it does not make a tent. Um, it spins the silky mats or, um, on the trunk and large branches where they congregate um, and also resting from feeding. Uh, they have a similar life cycle to the eastern tent caterpillars um, with some similar control methods. Um, identification, if you look on the back of the adult, you see those white markings on there. They kind of look like footprints going all the way down the back. Um, so that's how you would tell the difference between the two adults. Uh, they also have the blue parallel lines on each side. All right, oak wilt. So <laughs> this is a, a fun topic to always talk about. And whenever I go meet with landowners, I always feel like the Grim Reaper giving horrible news. Um, so all oak trees can be infected with oak wilt, um, but some are more resistant to it than others. Red oaks, um, which are our Texas red oak, the Schumart oak, blackjack oak, and water oak, these are the most susceptible to oak wilt. Um, these produce fungal mats. 
So whenever Red Oaks get it, they have 100% mortality. Um, so you need to, like, if you know that you have Oakville in the area, highly recommend just going ahead and do an injection just as a precaution. Um, so if you find out that your neighbors, you know, have it or whatever, um, but once it has it, you can't inject it to save it, it's done. It, it normally dies within about three to six weeks. So it's a very quick process. Um, our white oaks are the post oak, bur oak, Mexican white oak, the white shin oak, durand oak, lacy oak, and chickpea oak. Um, these actually show some tolerance. So it's very, it's not, I say it's not very, it's not as likely for these oaks to get it. It's very hard. So if you just have nothing but post oaks um, and no other oak species, it's probably not going to be oak wilt. But if you have, you know, a ton of live oaks and red oaks that have all had oak wilt, then the chances of the post oaks getting it does increase. Um, live oaks, these have an intermediate susceptibility. Um, live oaks are notorious for interconnecting their root system and they can actually spread the fungus through the roots. Okay, um, a common misconception with oak wilt is that it can live in the soil. That is false, it cannot, but it does pass through the root system to other trees. So live oaks also connect their root system to red oaks. So that's another way for your red oaks to get oak wilt. So they can pass it along that way. Could you describe, I keep reading fungal mass. What does that look like? What is a fungal mass? Where am I going to see? So it's underneath the bark. Um, I know it kind of sounds a little hollow whenever you hit on it. Uh, it takes a while for the bark to actually fall off. But let's say you pass by a red oak and you start smelling something sweet. And then you should not be smelling something sweet in the middle of a forest. It's, it, you go tap on the oak, you can normally find it. So um, I have, a, I should have a picture in here of what it looks like though. Uh, these are right now the current counties that have oak wilt in it. Um, confirmed cases, um, all these counties have had their trees taken or a sample taken in to the lab and then confirmed, yes, in fact, it was oak wilt. So, and then we document that. So oak wilt identification, again, red oaks, 100% mortality, die within, you know, I've, I've seen them die within about three weeks sometimes, it just kind of depends, but also four to six weeks. Um, the leaves turn on color in the summer months, so whenever you wouldn't expect them to turn red. Now this year it's a little weird, we are in a drought, you know, I know we have had some good rain recently, but we are still in the drought. We have a good amount of yellow and orange still on the map. Um, so we're seeing our oaks and a lot of other tree species, their leaves are turning brown. And with our red oaks, they are, you know, still turning that red color and people are freaking out thinking that they have oak wilt. Um, but what you'll see with red oaks is they do what we call flagging. So one limb over here turns red and then another one over here turns red and then eventually the whole canopy turns red. Um, so, and something that I want to mention you know, if you do suspect that you have oak wilt and you, you know, you hire someone to come out to take a sample of your tree, they cannot test for oak wilt in a dead tree. Okay, that is not possible. The fungus is not there. Um, so do not let an arborist tell you that. <laughs> okay, I've so had people. Can I ask you a question about that? Yeah. Yeah. So if the, if the fungus goes away uh, when the tree dies. What you're saying, right? So the test will test to feed on something that's living. Yes. So it does. It depends. So for red oaks, um, the fungus can still live in the tree, depending on the time of year that the oak wilt killed the tree. So let's say your tree died right now from oak wilt, it probably will not create fungal mats the next spring. But if your tree dies later this fall from oak wilt then it can produce those fungal mats in the spring. Does that make sense? Sort of. It's kind of weird. It, it, it's not an exact science, okay? <laughs> <laughs> we try. Yeah. It, sometimes it just depends. That's my favorite answer to anything natural resource. It depends. <laughs> um, there's a lot of factors going into that. Um, so, but that fungal mat is on that bottom right picture. That's what you would see. Uh, your white oaks, you're going to see some of the canopy loss, and then your live oaks, 
Um, these defoliate and die within about three to six months. What you're gonna see is that banal necrosis, which is that discoloration on the leaves. And I actually have a couple leaves with me if y'all want to pass them around. These are just leaves that fell on the ground. Um, and you can see the pattern of oak wilt even on um, brown leaves. So, you know, they've been there for a year. They've completely lost all green on them. Um, what it's gonna look like is the outer part of the leaf is gonna be that nice light brown and then the veins are gonna be a dark brown. And, but you still see that oak wilt pattern. Uh, when I see that, I know right away what I'm looking at on a live oak. Um, the earlier it's caught, the better. Ideally, you know, you wanna treat them with the fungicide before they start showing symptoms. But let's say you, you know, you've waited a while and they've been showing symptoms and then they've lost a good portion of their canopy. That is as good as your tree is ever going to look if it survives the treatment with fungicide. Um, the fungicide that we recommend using is propiconazole. Uh, it's through the brand Alamo. And so what the arborist would do is come out, dig around your root system at the base of the tree and then drill holes into those roots, pump, uh, pressurize a pump up to 80 PSI and then inject that fungicide. So it's basically forcing that fungicide up into the tree. So what oak wilt does is it shuts down the vascular system in the tree. So the tree cannot bring up nutrients and water and so forth. Um, so you're really having to force it in there. Uh, oftentimes in the summer, arborists are recommending if you do get your trees injected to water around the root system, that way it kind of triggers them to know that they need to start taking something up at least a day before they come out. It takes around two to four hours to inject, just kind of depends on the tree. Um, and also the weather conditions as to what's been happening. Um, it can be kind of costly to treat. I've had landowners tell me that arborists have quoted them anywhere from six to $9,000 to treat two trees. But I normally recommend uh, watching them do at least one or two of the trees. And then if you have a lot more trees that you want to save, um, you know, watching them do it, and then you can actually do it yourself. Because the actual fungicide isn't that much. It's the labor that is going to get you. Um, but it is about 15 to 20 dollars per, per inch of diameter of the tree is how much they're going to have to end up using so all right so oak wilt spread um movement of infected red oak wood or any uh wood essentially we tell people it makes it a lot easier just to not move firewood that you know from trees that have died of oak wilt because um, <laughs> people get really confused the difference between a red oak and a live oak and you just no wood movement at all. Um, so they spread by sap feeding beetles. So these are really tiny little beetles. Um, that bottle, bottom middle picture is a um, kind of just to give you an idea of how small they are against um, a quarter. They're about the size of the tip of your pen. Itty bitty. Um, and it's multiple species of sap feeding beetles, not just one. So it's not like we can just trap them and you know say, we're, we're done, we're good. Um, we're gonna be dealing with this. Uh, again, the live oaks have those interconnected root systems. Um, how do we manage it? You know, we're going to try to prevent those new infections. Removing and destroying any diseased trees. Um, red oaks, you know, pretty immediately once you realize that what has killed them. Um, proper pruning time and practices. So we recommend to not prune uh, between February through June. So, but this year we're also saying to kind of push that a little bit further into the fall. Um, just because they're, they are stressed. All the trees right now are stressed from the drought. Um, so if y'all wanna prune, you know, wait a little bit longer. Um, handling of firewood, again, you know, you don't wanna move it to new locations. You know, that's oftentimes why you see state parks and national parks saying, you know, no bringing in untreated wood or, you know, wood that didn't come from the park uh, is to pre prevent those spreads of diseases. Now, is that because the beetles are still in the wood? No, that's with the, the um, fungal mats. So like, like the red oak, if you were just, you know, you cut down a, a red oak that died from oak wilt, okay, you move that firewood to a new location and it had formed a fungal mat, you know, in that process, then it releases those fungal spores out. 
And so let's say like a tree in that, in that area that the wood had just been brought to, the fungal spores spread, they, that tree now has a wound on it, it goes on there and then it infects those trees. I've lost a bunch of trees here. So, so what's the beetle's role in the fungus? So the beetles, they feed on the sap of the oak trees. So they smell it all nice and sweet. We don't smell the sap, but they do. And they will spread the fungal spores from tree to tree. Okay. So, yeah. So they spread the spores. They, you know, it gets on their legs, kind of like, imagine like a bee, you know, with the pollen, and then it moves it to new places. So, uh, trenching, uh, we recommend doing that with the live oaks. Again, we know how the live oaks, they interconnect the root system by trenching. You know, we recommend anywhere from four to six feet deep. It doesn't matter on the width, the depth is what's important. You're wanting to break up that root structure. Um, basically just make a disconnect so the fungus cannot go past. Um, injection of the fungicide for the highly valued trees. So especially the ones that are around your house that you wanna save, um, you're gonna use that propaconazole. And diversification. That is probably the best advice I can give you out of this entire PowerPoint. Um, you know, if y'all just have, you know, you have, let's say you have five acres of just live oaks. Well, oak quilt comes through, bye-bye all your live oaks because they're all connected. So um, diversify. Making sure that you have multiple species of trees is probably your best defense against any disease. Now, all trees are susceptible to something. <laughs> they, they're a living thing. They are susceptible to at least something out there. Um, you just want to make sure that you diversify so that way you don't lose everything that you've, you know, you have on your vegetation wise. All right. So the gouty and horned gall, um, these are abnormal growths or swellings on plant tissue. It's caused by these little tiny, uh, non stinging wasps and they're, they're little itty bitty. Um, so what the, what it does is that when the wasp lays its, uh, eggs and Basically, the tree responds by forming a woody thing around it uh, that provides um, protection and food um, and shelter for the larvae as it develops, and then it will will leave that afterwards. Oftentimes, we'll see them af the gulls after the fact, so the wasp has already gone and done its thing. Um, aesthetically, it's not really pleasing, but it really does little damage to your tree. Um, you're going to see this really in early spring. It's from the wasp from the Sedipidae family. Emerald ash borer. Okay. So first detected in Texas in 2016, um, it attacks all ash species. Um, it's confirmed in um, various counties. I actually have, um, I have more counties, I think, on the other page. But um, in this area, it's Tarrant, Denton, Parker, Dallas, and Wise counties. We added four of those this year. So it started in Tarrant in 2016, and we added Denton, Parker, Dallas, and Wise all this year. Um, so the females, they do a, a maturation, maturation feeding uh, for 10 days after mating. Um, after they feed, they lay um, the eggs into the bark cavities, so into those little crevices, and then the larvae once it hatches, will bore in, okay? Um, and then they make these little gallery patterns, and I'll, I'll pass these around, but they're kind of S-shaped, kind of going all which direction. Um, and then on here, I also mentioned the D-shaped exit holes. That's what these are marked with red. So they are very distinctly Ds. So think the capital D. So, um, and then there's... I also have an adult and then a larvae. Um, also, if y'all wanna take a look, show and tell. Um, I like show and tell. Uh, so what you're gonna wanna do is just, you're gonna remove your poor conditioned ash trees. Um, they are gonna be you know, more susceptible, but your healthy ash trees are also susceptible. Um, Emerald ash borer does not, um, uh, it just, it chooses any of them. I've seen them on young ash trees. I've seen them on big mature ash trees. It just, they don't discriminate at all. Um, you're gonna wanna plant species that aren't susceptible to EAB. This is where 
diversification comes in hand. You know, the Dallas area, a huge part of their park system and around the rivers is nothing but ash trees. And so they're having to come up with a plan now because they have EAB in Dallas County and they're gonna have to figure out how they're going to protect all their ash trees that are their dominant tree species. Um, you know, we're also seeing like Arlington and Mansfield, a lot of their new trees they planted are ash. And I'm just like, oh, that was a horrible choice um, since we have this. But any of your high value trees, so the ones that are, you know, again, closer to your home, um, providing shade or whatever, you're gonna want to uh, treat those with a systemic in, uh, insecticide. And so just to clarify, it's all ash trees? Or all ash trees. Particular... Nope, it's all, oh. all of them. So, um, so we believe that EAB came from somewhere in Asia, and we believe that it made its way over here um, in a shipping container. So an adult laid her egg in some, some ash wood that was being used as a shipping container, and you know, it starts feeding on the wood, it gets over here, has formed into a full-fledged adult and has spread, okay? So funny enough, EAB is not an issue in Asia. So yeah, not an issue in Asia. So their ash trees evolved with EAB, okay? Our ash trees did not. So they actually do not know anything about emerald ash borer. They never have cared to because it never caused an issue. So everything that we know about emerald ash borer is only about 20 years old. What species are not susceptible? Anything that's not ash. Diversify. Um, when this when I first started reading about this, this it was it was pretty much a doomsday that this is going to do the ash trees what Dutch elm did, did Dutch elm disease and basically the ashes and eels are consumed. Is that still the thinking? Yes. That they're going to they're yes. just going to take it out and these are just going to be gone. Um, up north. Um, so I think it was in Michigan where it was first detected in the United States. Um, they do not have any more ash trees. You will notice that baseball bats are no longer made out of ash wood. They have had to move to a completely new material because they lost all their ash trees to do that. So there was a, there was a couple of blocks of uh, new homes in Denton where they had ash wood, the, the, the trees, mm -hmm. the street trees. They're all dead now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and the city is stuck. They've got they've got to take them out. That's a huge, huge yeah. thing. It, it's wow. I'm not recommending planting no. ash trees yeah. at the moment. We do think that there's a southern limit for emerald ash borer. So we we believe that it may get too hot at a certain point going further south. Okay. Um, but we're not sure exactly where that border is. So every year in the spring, we put out these purple sticky traps. Um, you may have seen when I put one out at the Weatherford Park Trail um, over by that dog park. Oh, I wondered what that was. Yeah, purple triangle trap. Yeah. Yeah, that's the EAB trap. Oh. Um, so we put a lure in there. Uh, it kind of smells like the ash leaves to attract them. It doesn't do a very good job at attracting them, um, but they're attracted to that very specific color of purple. Um, we do know that. I don't know how we figured that out, but we figured that out. Um, I guess. Um, so, but yes, we do the purple traps in the spring. Um, we're trying to figure out just how far they're spreading. Um, I, we put out around 500 traps a year. With so. the 112 degree temperature we had, do anything still going? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Everything that we know about emerald ash borer is only 20 years old. Um, I know at one point we did something stupid as far as br trying to bring over a wasp that hunts them over in Asia, um, over oh. here. Why we did that, I don't know. Why you would bring another pest over here that doesn't belong here to take care of But it didn't survive. It, it got too hot here. So that's why we think that there's going to get to a point where it's too hot for them to survive. That's why we've kind of come up with that theory. Yeah. So, 
Um, <laughs> I guess, I don't know. Who knows? Um, so you'll see the bark split. Um, you'll see that zigzag pattern that you saw on those on that sample. Um, it's not always that pretty. Sometimes whenever there's a lot of larvae or it's been many years, it gets kind of confusing to even tell where those channels are because they all kind of mix together. Um, the white flat larvae, as y'all saw, they kind of have like a bell shaped or I've been also told that it kind of looks like a spine. Um, and then you're also gonna see a heavy feeding by woodpeckers, okay? So if you start seeing a heavy um, feeding by woodpeckers on your ash trees, you know, you might be having an emerald ash borer problem. Um, unfortunately, that heavy feeding by the woodpeckers is noticed later on in the stages. So it could be a few years before you actually start seeing that. So how long does it take to kill the tree then? Years? Three to five years. Oh, okay. So if you treat them with this insecticide, how often do you have to treat them, these trees? Every year? I, think, I would think every few years. Every few years, and we recommend within 15 miles of um, where it's been last detected. So, you know, those around, those of you around the Fort Worth Nature Center, I, I would be injecting your trees. So, it's an it is an injection. You are, it's kind of similar to the oak wilt, as in you are drilling into the tree and then you are forcing an insecticide inside it mm -hmm. to kill it. So. I am not exactly sure how much the cost of that is, um, but I, again, I would think it would be kind of similar as far as labor goes, but you're not having to dig out around the roots. It's just straight into the trunk into the base. Um, this is our current map of what the counties where it's been detected. Um, you'll see the five um, counties in this area. Um, again, the total, uh, we've had added six counties this year. Um, that bottom website is our website for EAB. Um, you can just type in uh, TFS, TAMU into Google and then EAB as well, and that will pop up. Uh, it should be the first choice that shows up on that uh, Google page. All right, so soapberry borer, it's similar to EAB, but it has the white dots on its back, as you can kind of see in, in that picture, they're kind of, they're not very big. Um, Infestations are, are similar to EAB. It's originally native to Mexico. Um, beetle attacks and kills all sizes of soapberry trees uh, larger than two inches in diameter. Um, heavily infested trees um, will be completely girdled with white larvae feeding beneath the bark. So they're gonna make those similar patterns, but they're gonna not be so zigzag, but more straight lined. Um, you're gonna see dieback from the top and produce abundant amount of uh, sprouts from the trunk. Um, and it will take about three years to die. Uh, you're gonna want to uh, use a, a mascentin benzite systemic insecticide. Um, again, these produce a D-shaped exit hole. Um, there's not very many of our beetles that do that. Most of our uh, borer insects produce like a circle exit hole. Uh, Phytophoria uh, root rot. So this is gonna target the plant's root system, um, its ability to transport water and nutrients. Um, what you're gonna see is rotting of the stem crown and root of the plant. Uh, it's gonna impact many hosts, um, excessive yellowing and loss of foliage, uh, stunted growth. Um, you're gonna see some wilt and darkly discolored or dead feeder roots or stems. Uh, with severe root rot, you're gonna see stunting or wilting. Um, you're gonna see some abnormal foliage growth, uh, reddish brown discoloration, as you see in that bottom picture, um, and then a lack of new shoot development as well. And then also it can cause death of the tree. Um, cause is too much water, correct the irrigation problem. Um, a lot of times, you know, yes, we are in a drought. Yes, you need to water your trees to kind of help support them through this drought but there comes a point when the water is too much um, and you shouldn't be watering them as much as you are because that can actually cause more damage to them. Uh, Gandoderma root rot, um, it's gonna affect uh, hardwoods. It's extremely broad in the species that it affects. Um, you're gonna see some dieback, yellowing, uh, wilting and undersized leaves. Um, it's gonna cause the root system 
uh, can live in the root system uh, for decades before it actually expresses as a pathogen. Um, so you won't even see the fungus uh, for a while. So once you start seeing the fungus, you're you're done. Um, your tree is not going to make it. You cannot <clears throat> save it. Um, that would be the time to start talking to an arborist and getting quotes. Um, your drought related, uh, your drought stress plants um, and and plants growing under uh, suboptimal conditions, oftentimes in urban settings, um, are most susceptible. I see too many in the urban areas where people have these really nice St. Augustine lawns with these really nice live oaks, and then they wonder why their live oaks aren't doing that great, because St. Augustine grass loves water. Live oaks don't like a lot of water. One is a very tropical grass. One is a very drought tolerant uh, plant. So you got to pick and choose. You can't have both. Um, so dealing with that a lot. And people get really upset when their live oaks start going downhill because they've been watering their lawn too much. Uh, the wood, the wood, oh, I cannot speak tonight, sorry. Um, the wood becomes soft and fibrous and usually whitish. Um, the lignin cellulose and hemicellulose are usually decayed in the tree. All right, chicken of the woods. I've heard this is edible. <laughs> I've, I've heard that people cook it, that it tastes like chicken, but I'm not going to try it, so <laughs> I'm good. Um, <laughs> uh, it causes brown rot of the wood. Um, it's very common in live oaks in the fall. Um, once you see the free mushroom, there's really nothing you can do to see uh, to save the tree. Um, again, once you really see fungus on a tree, there's, you're probably not going to be able to save it. Um, brown rot, uh, only the cellulose and hemicellulose are decayed, but the lignin remains. The lignin is what causes that blocky pattern that you see in the bottom right photo. Um, kind of looks like cubes. Uh, Prinifolia, uh, filly filly, uh, whatever. Um, feeds on the corky outer bark tissue. Um, it does not decay the wood of the living tree. It just stays on the outside. Um, it's a type of white rot fungus. It's not an issue if you see it. Do not freak out. Don't feel like you need to go purchase any fungicide. It's fine. Um, not going to harm your tree at all. Um, everyone here knows what lignin is? No. Okay. Um, so... Or, okay, so that stuff that you see, I'm totally going blank. I'm sorry, it's so late. Um, the white stuff that you see oftentimes on trees, um, lichen, sorry, lichen, um, grows on the trees, right? That's, yeah, I need coffee. I have not had coffee today, um, and it's already late. So, that stuff does not cause issues. A lot of times people think that's a fungus, not going to hurt your tree, leave it alone. Um, you know, if you stayed still for long enough, you'd also have it on you. So <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> it's not going to hurt you or it's not going to hurt the tree. Um, <laughs> uh, Sporia, uh canker. So the infection progress starts from the smaller branches and goes into the larger branches. Um, you're going to see some dieback, cankers, discolored bark. Um, most trees and shrubs are susceptible to this. Um, so what you're going to want to do is avoid plant stress. And that's pretty much with a lot of these diseases that you're going to see um, is just trying to avoid as much stress as possible. You know, um, Right now, trees are very stressed from the drought, from winter storm Erie. Um, from that month of May that we had nonstop rain, you know, we've gone from one extreme to the next. Um, so they are stressed. So if you start seeing some weird things, you know, just kind of baby them and give them, you know, some TLC. Um, oak leaf blister, this is not going to hurt your tree. It's caused by the Tiferia corialis fungus. Um, these spores, they overwinter on the buds. Um, and then whenever the leaves start emerging, that's when the fungus gets onto the leaf. So the fungus isn't actually in the tree, it's just on the leaf. Um, how you're gonna wanna do it, uh, take care of it, is just like that next year when it drops the leaves, you're just gonna wanna rake up all those leaves and destroy them. Um, that's gonna help put a break in the cycle. Uh, 
uh, the leaf spot on oaks, you're going to see some small round uh, spots form on the leaves. Uh, they're kind of reddish brown in color. And then you see a yellow halo around that dark spot. Uh, you'll see that on the left bottom photo. Um, symptoms uh, may begin to appear in midsummer, um, but they're not normally noticeable or widespread until late summer, early fall. Uh, when the spot reaches a leaf vein, it expands uh, pretty rapidly, um, and you'll see it kind of take over the leaf. Uh, spores of this fungus are dismented by wind and rain splashing. Um, what can you do to stop it? Um, you're going to want to determine what's stressing out your tree uh, that is predisposing your oak tree to this fungal pathogen. Um, and then again, you're just going to want to remove those infected leaves, break them up and destroy them. Um, you'll be surprised that oftentimes that's all you really need to do whenever you see a disease on a leaf. Um, just remove the leaves and kind of stop that uh, pattern from happening again. Um, when I tell people that, they don't believe me and I have to, you know, kind of walk them through the process. So, um, live oak rust, um, this is going to infect pines in midwinter. Um, so, live oaks are semi evergreen. So, you know, they keep their leaves year round and then they drop those leaves when they replace their new ones. Um, the tell all stage is um, produced on the evergreen oaks. So you're going to see like a yellow to orange pustule um, on the oak. It's, so if you look at the right picture, you'll see these little yellow dots. They kind of look like um, like a like a fuzzy moss almost um, on the back. Uh, for mist tip light, you're going to see this mainly on eastern red cedar. Uh, branches die from the tip to the base. Um, your new young seed uh, needles um, at the end of the branch are more susceptible. Um, avoid wet, humid conditions and overhead irrigation. Uh, remedial pruning of disease tips and branches during dry weather. And then you can use fungicide to control the disease of your highly valued landscaped uh, specimens. I know a lot of people in the area like to use um, our junipers uh, for like kind of like a, a blind or some sort of break for sound. So, you know, oftentimes I would recommend doing that if you start seeing it on those. Uh, ceridium canker. So oftentimes you're going to see this on the Italian cypress, uh, but you can also see it on uh, juniper and um, arborvitae. Um, enters a tree by a wound through the bark. Uh, your cankered areas, they're going to continue to spread from the branch to the trunk um, and eventually will girdle and kill the entire upper crown portion of the tree. Um, spores will disperse during wet, rainy, and windy conditions. Uh, distinct sunken necrotic dead lesions will um, occur along the dead branches and sometimes with gummy resinous um, stuff linking out of the surface. So you can kind of see that on that bottom picture uh, where it kind of looks shiny and brown, kind of that darker color. Um, you're going to want to avoid stress and wounds. Uh, remedial pruning on the dying and dead branches uh, can kind of delay the disease uh, progress. So you're kind of seeing a theme, minimize your stress on your trees, and kind of you know help them out so that they aren't susceptible to disease. Cotton root rot, uh, pines, that grow in alkaline soils are susceptible. Um, primarily been a problem in Afghan pine um, species adapted to dry alkaline soils. Um, Chinese elm is also susceptible. Um, you're gonna see the symptoms are gonna occur between June and September. Um, your first symptoms are a slight yellowing or bronzing of the leaves. And then you're gonna see a rapid wilt as well. Um, the fungus generally invades new areas by uh, continual slow growth through the soil from plant to plant. So you'll see kind of at the bottom, uh, the rhizomes and they're kind of spread out through the soil. That's how it's gonna, gonna pass through. Elm leaf beetle. Uh, Chinese elm is the most affected. Uh, it's gonna strip foliage entirely from an elm. Um, there's no management needed in forests. Homeowners can uh, spray foliage though, if, uh, when they observe it. Okay, bagworms. Uh, these are found on our cedars, junipers, cypresses, and evergreens. I do want to make it really clear. We do not have cedars in the state. We have juniper. Uh, everyone calls them cedar, but that's not correct. 
um, all, of, all of our cedars, as people like to call them, are actually um, in the genus Juniperus. So I want to make that very clear. We have Junipers here in the state. Um, you may hear e that Eastern Red Cedar, still a Juniper. <laughs> <laughs> Common names lie. So I want to make that very clear. Um, these can also attack um, the broadleaf trees also, so your oaks, your maples, and your elms. Uh, several different species of moss are going to, you know, create these bags. Um, birds and insect parasites and insect par uh, predators are natural enemies of bagworms. Um, control method is to remove the bags. So if you see one, just go in and remove it. Uh, spider mites. <laughs> We've all dealt with these. Um, leaves bronze uh, colored, a yellowish dry or curled, shriveled or dead is what you're going to see. Um, their feeding results in a speckling on the leaves. Um, some of the leaves may turn brown and start to drop. Uh, with heavy infestation, you're going to see a fine webbing um, on the plant. Uh, population peaks during the spring and the fall. Um, immediate removal uh, and destruction of the dead and heavily infested plants is what we recommend. Um, Lacanium scale, um, it's mostly as often associated with the oaks, but hickory, birch, and many other trees and shrubs are also attacked. Um, infested trees often become sticky with the honeydew that it produces. Um, honeydew fosters a, like a sooty uh, mold fungi um, that darkens the leaves and stems and objects below. Um, it's very abundant on the urban uh, trees, so due to the high temperatures and drought and you know, all the other stressors that people in urban areas like to put their trees through, like putting concrete over a root system and so forth. <laughs> uh, pecan filiaxra. Um, so these are the galls on pecans. Um, so again, like an insect has gone and uh, basically laid its larvae and then it uh, forms over it. So it's the plant's reaction to another thing. Um, so the feeding injects the toxin into the pecan tree and the tree again responds by forming a gall around that insect. Um, so with high infestation levels, it can cause uh, deformities in the current year shoots, um, which reduce the tree's growth rate and overall tree vigor. So you're going to see some dieback as a result of that. Um, trees usually recover unless they are suffering from other stressors. So whenever you see galls like this or the oak leaf blisters, you know, your tree is going to survive. Just try to minimize those stressors on it. Um, and you will start seeing that recover in the following years. Um, so you can apply an insecticide after, um, but unless you like get it in time, there's no really no point in doing it. Uh, bacterial leaf scorch, uh, it's caused by the bacterium Zilia facidosa. Um, you're going to see it on oaks, sycamores, um, elms, box elders, and silver elder trees. Uh, vectored by insects, so often your, your leaf hoppers. Um, looks like a yellow band between the scorched. So if you look where that arrow is pointing, there's a nice yellow band that is in between the green and the red. Um, so you can start seeing some early defoliation and dieback. Uh, infected trees will eventually need to be removed and replaced. So oftentimes, especially this time of year, if we start seeing bacterial leaf scorch, it can also be, um, people can also think that it's oak wilt. So they kind of can look a little similar. So that's when the testing comes in hand. Okay, so that was the last one. I do, I have a, have thought, but um, you can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and uh, Instagram. And I do not know why everything got shifted downward. <laughs> um, I looked at this at home before I came, and everything was fine. Um, so on Facebook, it's the Central Texas A and M Forest Service, and then my contact information. Um, resources: the TexasOakWilt.org website. Great resource. Um, we do. Uh, actually control that one. Um, we created it a few years back and we keep it pretty well updated. We have a list of vendors um, on it. So if you're looking for someone to come out and certified arborist that has been Oakville trained, you know, you can find them there. 
Um, also, um, tree MD. So if you don't know what's going on with your tree, you can always look there as well. You can select like if you're seeing issues in your canopy or in your bark, you can select that part of the tree, what tree species you, you know, you're having issues with, and it will give you some ideas as to what you're doing. Um, and it can give you some recommendations as well. Is so. Tree MD is where? Oh, it's on the Texas Forest Info. Yeah, so uh, Texas Forest Info, or you can just type into Google Tree MD. We try to make it pretty easy to find. It should be the first one that pops up. Thank you so much for being here tonight, Kimberly.